All right, on your marks, get set, and let's go. Hey, welcome everyone uh, back to the CISO IT podcast from Automox. I'm your host, Jason Kikta. I'm the CISO at Automox. And this month uh, is, is a little bit of fun for me because we're talking about Linux and how important it is to us here at Automox. So I'm basically using this as an excuse to, uh, to talk about the history of Linux and, and how much it means to me as an operating system and, and what it's taught me over the years and, and how much fun it is. Like Linux is a lot of fun. And I think that, you know, if you're really into computers and you've never uh, played around with Linux, uh, you know, you, you're probably missing out. And uh, if you've never had used Linux as your primary desktop for any period of time, uh, then you haven't truly lived on the edge uh, because it's it's a bit of an adventure. And it's less of an adventure today than it was uh, 20 years ago when I did it. But, um, you know, Linux is just, it's, it's a lot of fun and lets you do so many cool things. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to tell you a little bit of, of um, you know, my personal love story with Linux. Uh, and Linux is, is, I think, older than a lot of people realize. You know, uh, I think uh, Linus Torvalds announced it back in 1991, which is really, really uh, a long time ago. And I remember feeling late to the party when I tried uh, Linux for the first time in 1999, I was like, wow, I'm behind. I'm not keeping up. And <laughs> obviously in retrospect, uh, I wasn't doing that bad, but um, you know, this was, you know, I mean, again, it was 99. So uh, you can already imagine that Linux was not something that uh, was just, it, it wasn't really feasible to download, right? That was the, uh, you know, the challenge at the time is that, you know, not everyone had internet access. And even if you had internet access, it was usually dial up. Uh, so the popular thing back then was, you know, you'd go to like, like a physical bookstore, like a Barnes and Noble, um, or some of the, uh, you know, dozens of other bookstores that, uh, along the way, you know, if I've all gone out of business and you'd go and you buy it like a magazine, um, computer magazines were really, really popular then, and not just things like 2600, but like there were, you know, PC World and PC Mag, and there were a whole slew of magazines devoted to Linux. And most of them, uh, the Linux magazines in particular, would have a CD ROM, right? Not even a DVD at that point, uh, usually, but, but usually a CD ROM that was, uh, you know, pre-burned with a particular Linux distro. And my very first one was Mandrake, a, a French uh, distro that I don't believe is around anymore today. And, you know, I got that baby and fired it up, uh, you know, part repartitioned my uh, computer to my, you know, my PC to shrink down windows and, and install this, this Linux partition. And then I was dual booting and it was just, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun because, you know, I, I'd used Unix before. And this was also, by the way, like before Apple had, um, you know, changed Mac OS, right? Because with Mac OS 10, um, you know, everything changed for Apple and they brought in BSD under the hood. And before that, it was it was all their proprietary system. And, you know, like I don't even think it had a command line. Uh, if it if it did, it, you can do a whole lot with it. But, you know, you, you really had to go to a, a real flavor of Unix to get that sort of uh, feeling of an operating system before Linux became widely available because it was, it was the only game in town and it was just, you know, having that sort of POSIX concept of, you know, everything's a file and, and, you know, you can pipe things uh, around and, and, and just being able to do so much from a command line interface was really neat. And it was also cool to see, the innovation that was happening uh, in GNOME and KDE at the time uh, of, of, you know, early Linux uh, desktop uses where, 
you know, was it the most stable thing? Absolutely not. Were there a lot of features missing? Sure. But you could really, um, you know, push the state of the art in what was possible in a, in a GUI. Uh, and, and it was a lot more exciting than what Windows and Mac were offering at the time in many ways, because there were just, you know, like, like widgets, you know, desktop widgets that, you know, here we are 20 years later, and they're now commonplace on Windows and Mac. But like back then, you know, you could do a lot of stuff in Linux way, way before you could do it in the mainline uh, desktop operating system. So it was very, very cool. And at the time as well, it was it was a little bit of counterculture, right? You know, I mean, this was back in the days when, you know, Steve Ballmer was uh, CEO of, of Microsoft and he was saying, you know, Linux is a cancer that attaches itself uh, in an intellectual property sense to everything it touches. And you had the CEO of Oracle out there saying, you know, Linux is was something like open source software is free like a puppy, it, which to be fair, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it is to some degree in that, you know, it's it's going to require some time and some patience and there's a learning curve. Um, but, you know, there was a big movement in the industry with, uh, you know, Microsoft really pushing the concept of total cost of ownership to show that, you know, you'd save so much money by sticking with Windows, right, especially in server contexts. Uh, over trying to bring in Linux and other open source tools to replace them, right? You know, buy ISS on top of uh, Windows NT or Windows Server uh, instead of, you know, running Apache on Linux. Uh, that was that was what they were really pushing for. And of course, you know, then you fast forward uh, <laughs> and, and life has totally changed because, you know, by 2011, Microsoft is one of the, you know, top five contributors to the Linux kernel, uh, you know, and then I think 2014, they were talking about how much they love Linux, uh, you know, and that was, that's Satya, right? Like that's Satya Nadella, that's, that's the current CEO of Microsoft talking about how much he loves Linux in, by 2014, right? Just, just, you know, 10, 10, 15 years went by. Uh, and they're saying that they love it. And then Microsoft have, has its own version of Linux. And I've heard people speculate today that, you know, Microsoft might end up doing with Linux what, you know, Apple did with BSD. I, I don't know if that's true, but it's just fascinating to see how much uh, the adoption of Linux has gone up over time and, and really has opened people's mind to, you know, open source software. And I remember, you know, uh, there being so much discussion at the time uh, and and back and forth. And I mean, right, these are the days of people having debates like the Cathedral and the Bazaar uh, about, you know, how we, we should develop in the future and people saying it would be, you know, it's going to be all of this or no, this will win out, you know, this will stay the dominant model. And, and reality is we find ourselves in a blended future where, at, you know, pretty much every commercial product in existence uses some degree of open source software and integrates it in, you know, the ones that have compatible licenses and there's some open source software that, you know, prohibits those use cases or, or makes it prohibitive and that's their choice and that's fine. And, and, you know, we've, we've really reached this diversity in the software ecosystem where no longer uh, does everything have to be bespoke one-offs. You know, we have a lot more commonality. We have a lot more, uh, common ways of doing things, you know, it, it spurned other innovations. You know, Line, a lot of people forget, you know, Linus Torvalds invented Git, right? He he created Git back in 2005 because he was frustrated that he didn't have, um, you know, good enough version control around Linux kernel development. So he invented Git and look at all the things that that spawned and what that's done for, for modern application development. Uh, you know, it just, it's really changed the face of the world. And, you know, it, again, right. Like debates that people thought would play out that, that ended up not quite playing out is, you know, everyone in the Linux world back in the day was just very focused on, you know, this will be the year of Linux on the desktop. And like, finally, like we're, we're going to beat windows. And, and it, in reality, like, now well, it's it's probably never going to be the year of Linux on the desktop, but who cares, right? Linux has probably the majority of the server market in the world. Um, 
you know, they certainly have, you know, the vast majority of embedded systems out there and small devices, right? So, you know, it's, it's a matter of best fit for the best tool. And there are use cases where Linux is great. There are use cases where Windows and Mac are great. Um, I, I love teasing uh, Windows users. Um, actually, I love teasing all users of all things because everyone seems to be sensitive to things. And we can have a great argument about whether Emacs or Vim is best Vim. Uh, but, you know, like these these old style flame wars that were very wrapped up in one thing winning or another, I think, you know, we all probably, my generation probably missed the forest for the trees to some degree because we were so focused on who's going to win and who's going to be dominant that we we didn't stop to think about uh, enough the fact that, you know, we're building these awesome new tools and awesome new possibilities. And this is what the world's going to run on. And it's going to play out in ways that we couldn't even foresee and use cases that didn't even exist yet. So it's, it's just been really fascinating to watch this journey over the last 25 years uh, of how Linux has truly come into its own and it's it's absolutely a mainstay of modern computing um, and has really, um, you know, in some ways found a lot of commonality while still maintaining its, uh, you know, its strong diversity. Uh, you know, it, it, there's just, you know, we, we've solved our way thing, through things like dependency hell used to be a, a common <laughs> catchphrase among Linux users because, you know, it was just very challenging to install packages uh, once upon a time because there are so many dependencies and then you'd have cross dependencies and incompatible dependencies. And like that isn't really a thing that a modern Linux user would stop to think about. Uh, same thing with drivers, right? It was just impossible to find drivers back in the day. And, and you know, it, it still sort of blows my mind a little bit when I think back that I was once at a point where, you know, I would get, have to go in and like edit a driver and mess around with the thing to get it working or to take a driver meant for an older piece of hard hardware and modify it to get on uh, to, to, to work with a newer piece of hardware that had come out in the meantime. Um, and like, that's, you know, largely, uh, you know, unthinkable today simply because the compatibility has gotten so much more robust. I mean, you still find some of these issues to a degree. I don't think they ever go away entirely because that's just the nature of computing, but it's, it's a night and day difference, um, to spin up a distribution today and, and, and be able to just have it just run and, and run like it's expected and not sit there and go like, okay, let me start writing down all the various things on my system that have suddenly that don't exist and, and aren't supported. And, and <laughs> I got a keyboard and a mouse and I at least got kind of video. So, uh, you know, let me start there. Or maybe I don't even have video, right? Maybe I couldn't even start up the, the GUI and I'm, I'm just stuck at the command line and all I got is a keyboard mouse and a command line. And, and now I'm just going to start hacking away at it until I can get this system into a usable state. It's just, it's just, you know, mind boggling how far we've come. Uh, and, and what I'm really excited is to see what the future holds, you know, Linux remains one of the major, I guess you call it a bastions of innovation within computing and, and tech in general is that it, it's it's somewhere uh, that people can do a little bit freer thinking. You can get a little bit closer to the hardware if you want. You can swap things out and build your own Franken system if you want to experiment or try new things or try to get it to run on an older piece of hardware or a smaller piece of hardware that just doesn't have quite the same capabilities or expand it to do new and novel things. Uh, and I think it's just, you know, it, it, even if it's not what you're, you know, what you're using on your day to day, uh, system for work, it's, it's still very important to us in computing because it's, it's one more point of pressure to force the in industry forward and to get us to innovate, um, which is just, you know, really exciting to me. So 
I don't know if I have any great predictions about, you know, where we're going to see Linux in the future or what it will uh, be capable of. Oh, gosh, Android. I forgot Android, right? So, like, you know, Android, um, you know, again, a whole ecosystem of, of mobile devices built on Linux. Um, so, you know, pretty much the only... Um, the only remaining, <laughs> the only remaining uh, uh, thing to conquer is the desktop. But you know, I think that's you know, again, I don't know that this is going to happen anytime soon. I don't know that it really needs to happen, but I think that um, you know we will continue to see Linux being a, a vital piece of the op of the uh, the ecosystem. Uh, I think that it'll probably um, you know continue to drive innovation and you know i don't know what the future holds for it but i'm i'm really excited to see it so um thanks for listening today and and joining me as i strolled a little bit down memory lane and you know uh reflected on what was really one of the pivotal operating systems in my life um and i tell you it's it's if you haven't you know, used it yet, or you've only used it in a work context and you've never installed it on a personal device, you know, give it a try, uh, partition a drive, buy an extra drive, get a Raspberry Pi, something and uh, fire it up and, and see what the art of the possible is because, uh, you know, you won't regret it and you'll learn more about computers in a shorter amount of time than you would from reading about it in a textbook, right? Experimentation is a great teacher and uh you're you're gonna you're gonna definitely experience some ups and downs with it but but you'll be the better for it so thanks so much and i hope to see you all next month <laughs> <laughs>